which looks suicidal, but it has two threats. For one, of course, we have the threat of the H6 knight, but also we have a different threat. Imagine we play now A takes B, then black would discover to his horror that bishop B5 is played, and queen D8 checkmate is coming next. So, castles, we have to castle ourselves to get out of this threat. And now, of course, we are going to lose a piece on h6. Now, before I go on, one of the really nice things about I like about this game, uh, and all great games, is that all of Black's pieces are used. And <laughs> one of the things here is that that knight on h6 ended up playing a role simply because White had to take it, and on the next move, he's going to have to defend his bishop. So all of Black's pieces will come into play in this game. Pawn takes pawn, and we're threatening mate on a1. White presumably had foreseen this, and plays queen e3. So his king can march to d2, and the queen stays in contact with the bishop on h6. And here is where Black really laid down the law. Bishop c3 x clan. And from here on out, I haven't find, found a way for White to defend. So already when White began his uh, supposed refutation with 9a3, he was presumably going wrong then. And maybe already was worse. So rook a1 is threatened. The bishop has to get taken. Takes, takes. And now White finds an interesting resource. Bishop a6. Blocking the rook and introducing the idea of queen takes c3. From c3, the queen would hold down a1 and attack mate on g7. So, the queen on e3 needs to be gotten rid of. Queen takes. Now, white has a choice. Pawn takes or bishop takes. Uh, in the game, bishop takes was played. Perhaps pawn takes would have been more... Um, more tenacious. Let's look. Pawn takes pawn. Rook takes bishop. King b1 is the only way out. Now, rook b6 would lead to a draw because the king just has to go back and forth. But black can play for a win with rook e8. Very slow chess. And uh, white has two ideas possibly to survive here. One would be to play... Uh, to come and take the c pawn with like rook d3 and rook c3, and the other would be to double on the d file and try to penetrate with the rook all the way to d8. So let's take a look first at rook d3. Bishop f5, rook c3. We still come over, despite the fact that um, the uh, pawn is gone, we're still creating threat. In particular, we're threatening to check on a1 and win the rook on a h1. So let's say white protects the rook. Check. 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 Now if you go back to b4, it's rook 1, a4 mate. So king d4, and it's looking bad already. Rook d5, king e4, rook a4, and now the only move really is knight d4, but then after c5, uh, black has a winning position. So very nice variation. Another attempt for white, like I said, would be to try to double on the d-file. But the horror suddenly for white is that there's no square for him to put his rook on the d-file that's safe. We saw in rook d3 he's going to get hit with bishop f5. And any other move he makes here, like say rook d4, is going to get harassed with a pawn. So he actually has no square on that whole d-file to put his rooks to prepare rook d1 and rook d8, which would save him the game. So I like this, too, in terms of economy of black's pieces, 
is that those pawns are keeping the rook from doubling on the d file. Okay, so let's take a look at how the game went. He played bishop takes e3, rook takes a6, king b1 is forced, now another nice move, bishop h3. Very nice. So if g takes h, we're simply going to play rook a8, and uh, the threat onto the a1 square is too much. So, what to do? In the game, white played knight d4, and we're going to see that there's some problems with that. Uh, another interesting try would be knight d2. But the problem here is that we'll simply take on g2. And now anytime you move the knight, say you just move the knight, and I take the rook, I, I simply have too many pawns here. This is just a winning position. Uh, the two pieces aren't going to be able to deal with that many pawns. So that's not going to work. And the key trick, I think, then, is rook g1. Now bishop f3. Very strong move. If knight takes f3, again, we have rook f a8. And uh, otherwise, we're just going to take on d1 with a similar position to the last one, where we have too many pawns for the uh, rook versus the two pieces. So, white plays knight d4 and thinks he has a shot now because knight b3 is happening. But the amazing thing is knight d4 allows rook b6. Now, imagine if king c1, we're just going to play rook a8 and there's no way to stop mate. Um, so, white has to play knight b3 and it looks good for a moment for white, but then... Boom, rook takes b3, pawn takes, and our bishop returns. Now if king goes to the a file, it's made on a8. So king c1 happens, and rook a8. And really a very nice mating pattern here, with the bishop covering the light squares and the pawn covering the dark squares. Absolutely no defense for white. White resigned here. Notice, even if he sacrifices a rook, the rook is still going to return to a8, and there's absolutely nothing that white can do once that rook comes to a8. The mating pattern is too strong. Notice, too, that the bishop can't even go to, like, d4 or anything to gobble up the c3 pawn. So a beautiful game played by players that most of us haven't heard of, um, and I thought this was a, a good example of hypermodern play and also a very nice example of tactical inventiveness in the middle game. So this is GM Jesse Cry.